are back on Play It Forward with Jeffrey Prather. Jeffrey, thank Hi. you for being on the show. Writer, director, producer. Um, a mind cannot touch. Mm, yeah. Um, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. For You're sure. welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself and the film in any way before we begin? Um, yeah, you know, I could say it's like a it's a 15 minute uh, short sci fi drama about a grieving neuroscientist who uses mind uploading technology to bring her deceased daughter back from the dead as a hologram. There you so have it. That's the pitch. <laughs> that's that's certainly um, better than I could have introduced the storyline. And you know, <laughs> the way I um, understood it as, uh, you know, watchers and the audience, it's it's this tragic film um, that, you know, nobody it's the parents worst nightmare yeah. um, about what do you do? if you have the means to this technology and you're grieving, distressed, emotionally distraught, like, you know, mentally unstable parent that mm -hmm. is trying to bring your child back. It, you know, is a very thoughtful film and it puts the viewer, it's almost by default into the dilemma of what do you do in mm -hmm. this situation? The first question, play it forward. What was the emotional, spiritual inspiration because this is quite a spiritual movie for mm. this film for this project for you yeah it was kind of twofold i mean one it was a very personal inspiration my own mother lost her firstborn child um and i don't think it would have ever really recovered she never really recovered from it i think in terms of like her <clears throat> emotions and being able to process like pain and trauma um, and then the other inspiration for it was much more external, which was the tendency we have to always cling to nostalgia in the past and bringing back people as, you know, musical artists, especially as holograms like Tupac Shakur, or Michael Jackson. Um, recently, I know they had announced that they were going to bring back James Dean to star in a movie. I don't know if that's going to happen now, but like, yeah, the idea that we just even with people we don't know, we have such a difficult time letting it, letting it go. Um, and so if it's somebody that you actually like love and care about deeply, like how impossible that is to actually, you know, it can seem anyway to like grieve and the loss and move forward. Wow. Yeah. Jeffrey, um, thank you for sharing that with us. You know, yeah. it's not, um, I think every filmmaker who makes a movie is emotionally interconnected with their movie. Um, and sometimes you realize it after you make the movie, just how much so it is a reflection of your life and psychology and whatever it, it may be where you're processing at the time as yeah. an artist. I mean, that's really what it should be, you know, mm -hmm. to, to capture the spirit of the film and, and the spirit of the viewer. So, um, you know, thank you for sharing that with us. I can't imagine what it must be like to have grown up with you know, a parent who never fully processed that. And then you were the child. And so you're in a way always living with this, you know, disembodied entity. Yeah, for sure. Um, so that's, you know, one of those things that, you know, we often face as young people that ultimately makes us more sensitive and mm -hmm. mature and, and wise as, as we mature into adulthood. Um, so, I think, you know, the second part that you discuss with the holograms, like what? Like, I don't watch television. I don't know what's <laughs> going on in the world. What, I, what are you talking about? Yeah, but, I think um, I think the first time may have been like 2011 or 12. And it was at a, an award show and it was after Michael Jackson had passed. And they had created a hologram using like footage from him to have a performance of Michael Jackson. And then the other really famous one is Dr. Shakur at Coachella. They did a show, him and uh, like Dr. Dre was there in real life. And then Tupac Shakur was there as a hologram. I think that, that was is, 2014. That is yeah. sick. I mean, that, that <laughs> seems like it should be illegal. Yeah, it's, I mean, I don't know the legal process of doing it. I'm hoping they went to their estates and whoever was in charge of that and was like, this is okay, but. That is insane. I had yeah. no idea. Yeah, you I can mean, look it up. It's really technically that, impressive. It's very, I've, even eight years ago now, it looks incredible. <laughs> that's some scary. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty weird. Wow. 
um, which so makes your movie that much more relevant. And, you know, I had a lot of, you know, in preparation, I, I really like to reflect on the movie and, and there's so much, you know, thematically, and there's so much in the subtext of the movie. And I'd like to engage in that as part of this conversation. Like, what is the message of the film as a viewer, you watching it now? How do you understand it? How do you interpret it? Well, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head is that I want the viewer to feel the dilemma that the mother faces and put themselves in the, that position to think, would I do this if they had if I had the opportunity? Um, and I guess on an emotional side of it, like, you know, thinking about and even like a religious side of it or a spiritual side of it, like what it really means to be alive. Is that actually her daughter? It's not really her daughter. It's just a representation of her daughter. Her, It's her consciousness, but it's not her. So like I wanted that 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 would uh, be a big experience for the viewer. Um, but really at the core of the emotional journey of the mother, like kind of putting the blinders on and being like, because I can do this and I want it so badly, I'm gonna do it. And having to face the reckoning of like a child that didn't have any ability to give consent or a choice that this was gonna happen to her to suddenly find herself in that life and then having to deal with the fallout of that. So that was the big emotional arc I wanted people to experience. You know, and and you do, you know, yeah. that that works. And I think, you know, for me, there, of course, is that level of the drama that's playing out. Like, it's just the right mm -hmm. thing to do. Here we are, we're experimenting, experimenting with our, our soul, spirit level, and yeah. the morality of that. But, you know, I think another layer even beneath that for me is it's a lie. You know, she's, yeah. oh, it's a total lie. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's right. It's deception and is deception mm -hmm. even out of this, you know, what we call love, right? This yeah. seemingly justified thing mm -hmm. ever justified. Yeah. Yeah. Know? I mean, in, in the lying, I think really, I, I wanted to explore the grieving process. And a big part of that is denial. And her choice to lie to her own daughter about this is like, a component of that i think it's just like she she can't let go of her she's in denial and because she has the means to do this she thinks that kind of entitles her to do whatever she wants you know and and if it means lying to her daughter in order to try to get her to believe in the fantasy of it then she'll do that yeah yeah and it's there's a lie to her daughter there's a lie to herself there's even a lie to her husband yeah and it's like is a lie ever really justified mm -hmm. and you know, for me in this movie, no, the answer is no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. That I think so, too. And like I, you know, that is a big thing in like a lot of religions like Buddhism, like talks about is a lie ever justified. And they pretty much answer no, there's different school of thought. And I did want to play with that idea of like, is it ever the right thing, even in dire circumstances to lie, you know? So, yeah. I yeah, and, and I love how she begins talking like, oh, this is the right thing to do. This is right. You know, this is right. It's, you know, that moral dilemma is opened up right from the get go. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know, the other thing that I thought was really cool about the movie, a very different relation to some other films that may have, you know, tackled this theme is ultimately the computer wants to self-destruct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's almost as if like the personality that's been programmed recognizes its own human limitation and wants to turn off can you speak about that yeah i mean i think i wanted to like how horrifying it would be to like realize that your whole world was going to be contained to what someone else could create for you you know and like that's why i mean i don't think that's much of a life like living in a box to where a person can create whatever reality they really want for themselves and i really wanted to play with the idea of like you know, she had no choice in the matter and she had no, she had never given consent. This was totally like sprung upon her consciousness with no ability to do anything about it. And so I think if faced with that and not having any sort of choice, you would choose, you would choose to self-destruct. You would, you wouldn't want that because in essence, her mom is now not her mom anymore. It's like really her God, you know, like that, for that program, like, like there's no agency, like she can't make any choice on her own without going to the mom to create something that allows it. And ultimately it's, it's a question of freedom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and then, you know, the human choice is, is that a life without freedom isn't worth living. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, 
sure. what I find, you know, the way the movie plays out the sequence of events is that even the machine, right? Because it's not the human, but even the machine based on however it can interpret or be programmed, the human language um, comes to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Jeffrey, how have you been changed after making this movie? Well, I mean, like on an external level, like, you know, I met a lot of great people and managed to get like an awesome investor for it. So like it has kind of changed on a professional level. It's like been a huge like <laughs> upswing. But on a personal level, I think it has it was kind of difficult making the film just because like um, of my personal experience with this sort of thing. And, you know, just kind of having to think about what I would like more about what I would do in that actual situation, like losing loved ones. And I'm getting older and kind of like thinking about like, that's going to happen more and more as, as my life goes on. And right now this technology isn't, isn't uh, possible, but maybe one day it will be. And one interesting really thing that happened during the casting process, like during callbacks, the amount of people that like share their own personal stories about loss and how many of them actually said that if this was possible, like they would do it in a heartbeat, like they wouldn't even hesitate like to bring a mom back or bring a sister back. And it was that was that was actually surprising to me because I figured if you'd read the script, I'm not trying to like too much lead people. I think it is something we would all think about doing. But the amount of people who were just like, I'd absolutely do this was kind of eye opening for me. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, you know, that comments on the amount of people that are out there that haven't fully grieved or haven't fully mm -hmm. processed um death you know there's so yeah. many of us that have you know we don't like to talk about death as a society sure. or as a yeah. people you know whatever and especially i guess as a society so how do how do you function in mm -hmm. a healthy way when that's the reality and everybody here is going to die yeah. so um you know I think on that note, as far as both like the message and how you've been changed, how have you been changed in terms of your relationship with death? How is your relationship? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been, I mean, pretty much since making this movie, I've thought about it a lot because I mean, you know, when you're editing it, when you're writing, you know, when you're making it and now submitting to festivals, like I'm constantly thinking about the movie. And since that is one of the major ideas it deals with, like, yeah, I mean, like I am. I think I'm like probably a lot of other people I'm working towards like accepting that as a natural part of life and in the lives of others, but it is, it's a struggle. I think for all of us to like, you know, think about your know, own mortality and like the fact that one day this is all going to be gone and trying to like figure out how I can make the most of my time here and maybe change my priority priorities a little bit from like so much external validation, <laughs> which I think filmmakers <clears throat> inevitably have to kind of chase um, to more like, I've made this film and I'm happy with it, like the way it is. And like everything I do from here on out artistically, I just want to be satisfied for myself and not worry about what happens with it as much. Well, I think that's key. And I think that's key to really <clears throat> maturing as an artist and becoming um, a successful artist in your own experience yeah. of what that means. Because, you know, the external validation is never going to be enough. There's always that carrot to chase. Yeah. And I think it's <clears throat> limiting, you know, it's just amazing to get to that point where, oh, you can feel that opening, that door opening, and it can potentially even allow you to be more um, of a risk taker. In yeah, for sure. Art. Yeah. Um, you know, filmmaking is different historically, um, but I think it's changing in terms of the amount of financing needed and the amount of people mm -hmm. needed. So, you know, a musician, you know, singer songwriter, a writer, you know, poet, you know, there is now that, uh, uh, you know, that gaps kind of closing with all the yeah, technology sure. that can make it a little more accessible <clears throat> to, you know, just putting it out there. Yeah. Um, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a great thing. That's yeah. a great thing. And, you know, that's what we hope to contribute to as far as equalizing the play field. Yeah. Um, Jeffrey Prether. Uh, Prather. Yeah. Ah, okay. It happens all the time. <laughs> Jeffrey Prather. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being on the show. A yeah. Thanks for having me touch. Again. It's a, a really strong, compelling film and, you know, one that wrestles with, you know, the major uh, issue of life, which is death and how to move on beyond it and yeah. cope and, and really live. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's what we're all trying to do. That's what we're all trying to do. Yeah.
All right. Until um, next time, thank you again so much for being on the show. I'm going to yeah. kill it. Uh, kids, stay with us uh, for future episodes.